OK, so let's take a look at the problems with having a bus. And actually, the bigger problems with having a cache. So here we show a little bit of example here, which has two CPUs and two caches. And we have main memory. And then everything sits on a bus. Now why do we want a cache? Well, we've discussed this in great detail in this class that caches make your program go faster because you don't have to go communicate with a distant memory to go access some piece of data that you've accessed either uh, temporally or uh, uh, temporally recently or has spatial locality with some other reference that you've done recently. So let's, let's take a look at what, what happens uh, in a space ex example. So let's say at address A here, we start off with everyone having the value of 100 in their respective caches and in main memory. So address A has value 100. Now, let's say, let's suppose that CPU1 updates address A to value 200. OK, so let's look at this in, in two cases. The first is in the right back case. So all the caches here are right back. So CPU1 updates this to value 200. But this is a right back cache. OK, so what, what happens to the values in memory and in cache 2? Hmm. Well, all of a sudden, we have a stale value. The newest value is here. It's going to be 200. But here in memory and here in the cache 2, we have the old value. So if CPU 2 tries to go read address A, it's going to continually just get the old value. Likewise, main memory has uh, an out-of-date value. Now, where does this become a problem? Well, CPU2 never sees the, the, the value that got updated for address A. More, more to the point, what happens if CPU2 tries to go update uh, uh, cache 2 here with a, a value 300, we'll say? Well, now we've got a big problem. Now we have three different values. And this is going to cause problems for both our memory consistency model, but also just to use this system, you know, you, how do you know when the value has been updated and is, and is shown? And we can see that it's because we have a cache is here that this problem exists. And it's because we have uh, two caches that we, we get stale values either in other caches or in main memory. Uh, OK, so question comes up. Maybe this is just a problem with write back. Write back caches, yeah, they're optimization. You know, they, they write only when they need, and they can store dirty values inside themselves. But maybe we should be using write through caches instead. Because then, at least, everything goes out to main memory. So let's take a look at this same example here. So let's reset. We have 100, 100, and 100. Now CPU 1 goes and does a write to address A with value 200. But now it's at least write through. OK, so that writes 200 here and 200 here. So the question comes up, does cache 2 see this? And CPU 2 see this update? No, we have no mechanism to do this. And this is going to motivate why we want to build cache coherence protocols. So we do the update here. We're going to have basically value 200, 200 here because we wrote through. But CPU2 will never see that update value because it already has address A with value 100 in its cache. Um, so two questions here. Do these stale values matter? Yes. The stale values are definitely going to matter. So what happens here? Well, you will never see the updates in the other CPU. And Hence, there's basically no way to communicate. Second question here, what is the view of shared memory for programming? Well, the sort of a question here is, you need to have some notion of when a store to a particular address or a particular value shows up in another processor. 
And right now, if we look at this case here, there's no mechanism for the other processor to ever see that updated value. So even if CPU2 does a million reads, it'll never get that updated value because it already has address A with value 100 in its cache. So it could sit there and read, uh, it could sit there and do a write that might update main memory, but it will ne still never have seen the update from CPU1. And that's problematic, because how do you build programming models for that? And, and more to the point, this, this affects your consistency model. So let's take a look at uh, write back caches with sequential consistency. So this is using the same example we used from class uh, last, last time. So just to recap, we have two threads that are sharing uh, memory space. And we're going to call the one T1 and the other T2. And the uh, T1 stores 1 to x and 11 to y. And concurrently executing, T2 loads y into a register and then stores that register out to Y prime, so a different memory address. And then it loads X into R2 and stores R2 into X prime, a different memory address than X. Uh, different memory address than X, that's correct. So what's going on here? Well, you notice that we, we purposely sort of made a tricky case here. We made program one or, or thread one write x and then y, and then thread 2, read y, then write a different value y prime, and then read x, and then write a different value x prime. So we've basically purposely flipped those, those two values. And let's take a look at what happens with a write back cache and see if by the virtue of having a bus with a write back cache violates sequential consistency. OK, so let's. So we said in sequential consistency, all execution orderings and interleavings where we do not reorder instructions uh, need to be valid. So we can choose a purposefully complex or purpose, purposefully uh, hard case here. So we're going we're gonna to basically do that. So we're going to have thread one execute first. So to completion. So What's going to happen is we're going to have three, uh, two caches, cache one, cache two, and main memory. And we're going to look to see what's in these values uh, as, as time goes on here. And time's going to move uh, down on this graph. So the first thing that happens is memory x and memory y. Memory x has 0 and y has 10 in it. And that's just the, uh, the initial conditions of this problem. OK, so T1 gets executed. Well, so that writes 1 and 11 to cache 1. Now, note, because this is a write back cache, we have not updated memory here. So it has a stale value. And this is going to cause us problems in our consistency model, in our sequential consistency, uh, sequentially consistent consistency model. OK, what happens next? Well, let's say x1, or excuse me, x and y are on different cache lines. So they are able to write back independently. So we're going to say that cache 1 writes back y, but not x. Hmm. Yeah, I should start seeing that there's going to be a problem here. So in main memory, we have y has 11 and x has 0. Ooh. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a sort of final case we don't want to see. But let's, let's keep moving forward here. OK, so then we run thread 2, or thread t2 here, to completion. So it reads the, main, the values from main memory, brings it into its cache, does the updates here, but it doesn't actually do a write back yet of these new values. So then let's say cache 1 writes back x. So now main memory says 1 and 11. Hmm. That, that's, that's not good, but at least that's sort of uh, 
what program T1 would do if you normally executed. But, but what's not good about this is cache 2 here is not consistent with main memory. You can see that x has 1 here, but this cache says that x has 0. And then finally, cache 2 does a write back of x prime and y prime. So it's going to write back what the values it had, which were 0 and 11. Now, you may recall from the previous uh, uh, class that this was a sequentially inconsistent memory output. This is never supposed, supposed to happen in a sequentially consistent system. So all of a sudden, what we did is we took a, a uh, memory system, we introduced caches, and by virtue of having these caches, we took a system which would potentially implement sequential consistency, and we broke it. And we broke it because of the stale values in caches. So this is for the write-back case. So write-back caches can basically cause sequentially inconsistent values to end up in main memory when you're done, and likewise in, in caches. OK, let's uh, walk through a case here, sort of similar thing, but for write-through caches. Because write-through caches, we're going to find, are, are not particularly uh, better either. But to get this case correct, we need to be uh, a little bit more contrived. So same program here, cache 1, memory, cache 2. And at the beginning of time, we're going to say that cache 2 in the value uh, uh, x here has 0, which is consistent with main memory. So some reason cache 2, let's say, read value x in a previous program a long time ago for some other reason. So cache 2 has x being 0. And what we're going to show is this x being 0 in cache 2 is going to cause some stale value to live on beyond uh, uh, the expected time. So let's say thread 1 executes. So thread 1 executes and it updates x with 1, y with 11, and it's right through, so this gets pushed to main memory. So these two caches are on a bus, and there is no communication happening uh, on that bus, modulo just sort of communicating with main memory. So the other cache doesn't react. OK, that's, that's OK. Let's see what happens now. T2 executes. Thread 2 executes. Well, it reads from main memory, but you'll notice here that it doesn't have to read x0, or uh, x, excuse me, because x is already sitting in its cache. It has the stale value here. Hmm. Well, why, why does it not need to do anything? Well, it's because we haven't said that we need to actually change how a bus works. We just said, when you go to read something, you can pull it into your cache. And if people pull things into their cache, there's no way to ever kick things out of a cache, unless you know, it falls out because of capacity issues or conflict issues. Well, it goes and reads this, and then it does a write, let's say, to x prime and y prime. And here, we get value 0 and 1 for x prime and y prime. And this causes uh, sequential consistency to break. This is a non-sequentially consistent execution. So just because you have write-through caches on a bus does not guarantee that you're going to have a sequentially consistent execution. Hmm. OK, so now the question is, we, we spent all of last class talking about sequential consistency. What good is this for? If we, if, if our, by, uh, by putting a cache into it, all of a sudden we break that whole model. What's, what's the solution to this? Well, we're going to introduce an idea here called cache coherence. And we're going to contrast that with memory consistency models. So, or being uh, uh, cons uh, memory consistent somehow. So we're going to define a cache coherence protocol as something that ensures that, let's say, uh, all writes by one processor are at some point in the future eventually seen by another processor. 
And we're going to say that a, you typically have some sort of cache coherence model or cache coherence system, underlying system, which allows you to maintain some, uh, some consistency model. So in effect here, what you're doing is cache coherence protocols are the underlying implementation, which allows you to uh, have these stronger uh, guarantees. And the stronger guarantees are what makes the programmer's life easier. As we discussed in last lecture, the programmer wants some sort of guarantee. And we, we had discussed sequential consistency as one of the ways to go about doing that. OK. Um, so we're going to spend the whole rest of the class talking about how to go build a reasonable cache coherence protocol. And as I said, uh, memory consistency models are just the rules that the cache coherence protocol tries to uh, observe. And uh, an important thing here is you can have different cache coherence protocols and different consistency models. So just because you have a cache coherence system doesn't mean you have, for instance, sequential consistency. In fact, sequential consistency is a very strict form of a consistency model. There are much looser models out there. And in fact, uh, most processors you go by, uh, commercial multi-processors that you go by, are not sequentially consistent. They do have cache coherence, but they, those cache coherence uh, implements something in, uh, that is typically looser than sequential consistency, and people will actually define different consistency models. And we talked about a few of those things last time, like total store ordering, um, weak consistency models, things, things like that. So it's the combination of the cache coherence protocol <clears throat> implementing a sequential consistency model which allows you to actually go build useful software systems on multiprocessors.